Welcome everyone, Simon here from the Wells of Wall Street. We've got a fantastic interview video here with Gemma from Power Ledger, who's kindly returning to the channel to discuss some really exciting updates relating to Power Ledger and the POWR token. We'll also go through some other really cool topics and particularly one of interest to me is the hydrogen sector and how Power Ledger is involved with that side of things as well. This comes off the back, of course, of some further developments that we've seen across the globe in relation to blockchain and DLT integration into the existing energy sector, of which Power Ledger is leading away in terms of that P2P trading and other great initiatives to help not just us as consumers, but also the commercial level of the energy sector in terms of prosumer and consumer ability when it comes to the utilization of blockchain technology. So guys, let's go straight into this one. It's absolutely fascinating and we'll catch up after the video. Okay, everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Gemma from Power Ledger. Thanks for coming on the show, Gemma. Brilliant to see you again. Uh, it'd be fantastic for those that are new to the channel or perhaps Power Ledger in general for a bit of an introduction from yourself and also Power Ledger as well. Sure. Uh, so, Power Ledger is a software company and we make applications for utilities that help them track and trade renewable energy and for their customers to be able to trade uh, energy with each other and also for companies that need to track their energy um, to support their sustainability goals and targets. And also we have an application to allow the trading of environmental commodities. So that's things like renewable energy certificates and uh, carbon credits. And we're seven years old. And we um, have about 20 clients in 10 countries. Um, we've had you on the channel before. Um, so those that wish to see that previous video, because there's a much more in-depth uh, information around Power Ledger and an introduction to that as a project and technology. But what would be really good, Gemma, is just really quickly, particularly to touch on what you just mentioned in terms of the peer-to-peer -peer carbon trading, could you go into a bit more detail about that? Because I, I personally find that a really fascinating subject. And I think a lot of people out there perhaps are new to this or haven't even heard of it before and would really want perhaps a better understanding of that, if you wouldn't mind. Certainly. Uh, maybe it's you know best illustrated with a couple of examples. So uh, we're working in France with um, one of the largest energy suppliers there, a company called Equator. And we've developed a product with them called Choose Your Mix. So customers can actually choose up to 70% of their energy by type and actual place. So, for example, they might want 10% solar from a particular solar farm or 15% wind from a particular wind farm or biogas. And they can actually specify up to 70% of the energy they're consuming. And what we do is we measure the output of the asset, like the solar farm, against the load the energy load consumption profile of the customer. And we match that together and we record that on the blockchain. And so customers are able to say, I'm getting my energy from that place. And they can also support their local energy projects. So that's one example. Uh, another one is a peer-to-peer -peer example in Austria. So we've developed a product uh, with... Um, and a large energy supplier in Austria and uh, for customers in farming environments that might have a lot of land that have installed solar, they can sell their surplus solar to other farmers and other um, customers peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. And so the energy supplier wants to be able to allow its customers to do that and we've been, we're the solutions provider for them. So it's a white-labeled product. Um, and then a couple of other examples. So in India, we are doing peer-to-peer -peer trading, but for what's called a power purchase agreement. So a power purchase agreement is when a company agrees to buy electricity from um, like a generation asset, such as a solar farm or a wind farm. So they enter into a contract and it normally will go for like five years or 10 years, something like that. Um, and they typically the way the contracts work is that they have to pay for the electricity, regardless of whether they, they consume it or not. And so they're not always consuming what they're contracted to purchase. They've got spare. Um, and using our platform, uh, the energy supplier 
in India is able to allow their customers to trade their surplus power purchase agreement, surplus PPA with other customers. So what that means is the customer that's got the PPA um, that's got spare can sell that to others and actually recoup some of the costs. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I think that probably gives you a bit of a kind of sense of the different use cases, which basically starts with tracking electricity. So we track type, time, place, device. And once you've got that data layer, then you can sort of spin up these different types of markets or mm. um, ways of, um, you know, tracking electricity. And it really allows innovation around commercial models and and business models. And since we set up the company seven years ago, you know, initially it was, you know, as a startup that's just started, it was around proving that the technology worked. And then, um, you know, once you validated that, I think the next sort of phase that we went through as a company was around uh, customers wanting local examples. Like an Indian company did not really care about a French example. Mm. They wanted something that was in their market. So um, that I think was creating the lighthouse projects that were really relevant to the context and the markets in which we wanted to operate. And then I'd say the kind of inflection point that we're in right now is around commercialization. So customers have, you know, had the projects um, they've, and they've understood the opportunity for them in terms of offering new products to their customers. And now they're wanting to roll those out um, at scale. So that's uh, very exciting for us, you know, having worked on the project for a number of years to see that, um, yeah, inflection point in the maturation of the markets, I would say. So from a focus perspective, Europe is very important for us uh, and um, India also. And for trading of certificates, I would say um, India and the US are particularly important. Oh, that's brilliant. I suppose like there's a lot of application behind all of that for sure and a lot of framework. Um, and of course, the interaction with the power token POWR for those that uh, ever want to find it on an exchange. The whole point as well, really around this video, of course, is some really big news from your side. Um, I think this is super exciting. It's, of course, massive for the development of, of you guys as a project and as a technology uh, solution to the world. Um, here's the platform, Gemma. Um, it'd be great if we could share that information with our audience right now. Certainly. Well, um, in May of 2022, um, Power Ledger announced that it was moving from an Ethereum-based blockchain uh, to a Solana-based blockchain. And we did that because there were real limits to throughput with the Ethereum um, technology. And even with things like Layer 2 and sharding, it was not going to create enough um, capacity in terms of transactions per second for um, for electricity markets for these kind of very lots of you know transactions um, per second and so and Solana I mean Ethereum can process sort of uh, you know 15 transactions per second and maybe with the upgrades might get to say 100 and there are some kind of gen 3 blockchains that um, can get you know 1,000, 2,000, 3, 4,000 transactions per second um, but Solana really, uh, in the research and development that we did, presented itself as, you know, being in a completely different class with uh, an ability to process at least 50,000 transactions per second and actually more, really only limited by the amount of machines that the mm -hmm. blockchain is using. And so we just thought it made so much sense to um, move te uh, layer one technologies. So we did a, a clone of the Solana blockchain and adapted it further for the electricity use case. And we've been running that as a private consortium chain since May of 2022. And today we're announcing that we have made that uh, blockchain public. Uh, and so we're very excited um, to announce that news. And uh, what that means is that third parties will be able to use that blockchain um, for their applications if they would like to um, have a blockchain element to their offering, a blockchain use case that they can see. Um, so that is a yeah, very kind of significant change, I'd say. Um, we're also using the blockchain for our own applications, which I've given you a bit of a sense of a moment earlier, but that this means that other application developers will be able to use that. And I think in the future dApps as well, which will be, yeah, very 
I'd say, significant advancement in the different use cases. And I would say it's a little bit, the, the Solana piece, like in terms of the throughput, you know, it's it, it, you kind of, what's analogous to, I think, is probably the best way to kind of understand it or think about it. Like Uber as a technology, it couldn't have existed without mm. a few ingredients. So what were the ingredients? They were GPS. They there were um, maps, and everyone had a phone. And once you had that together, then Uber could have been contemplated. And I think with the data layer um, for electricity, plus a lot of throughput, then that opens up you know enormous possibilities in terms of different use cases that couldn't otherwise be conceived. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how as the market is, you know, moving out of just purely, ex, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, pilot phase to really understanding what's the commercial opportunity and having a highly performant blockchain that allows um, some of these things to be imagined and actually implemented to see what is going to open up. And uh, the Power Ledger chain based on Solana has a native token, uh, which um, there will be... Um, uh, the ability to exchange with the power token on uh, the Ethereum network. Mm. So there's the power token on the Solana network and the power token on the Ethereum network and the ability to um, exchange those, uh, which will be rolling out later this year. So I think this um, is very exciting to um, create the bridge between them and also, um, yeah, uh, continue with the power token as an ERC-20 token, um, but also create this use case and the um, the power ledger chain is secured with um, power tokens um, it, on either of the um, uh, the networks and that's used for staking. So um, power token holders can stake their tokens and wow. in exchange providing the service to maintain the chain and, and be paid for that. And then um, the other use case is the, the transaction fees to write data to the chain. So they're the two uh, primary use cases. Uh, for the token for both our applications, but also third parties. That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that because um, I know off off camera, we've, we've just been speaking about uh, the UK's development, certainly within uh, the use of cryptocurrency, digital currencies being signed off by law. We now got trade finance. There's an energy bill going through, albeit doesn't in intricately um detail dlt but we know that through parliamentary documents um that dlt ai iot are very heavily orientated with each other for this development in the energy sector so it is it's fantastic that you guys are thinking ahead and certainly from that transaction perspective you know uh, if you want the mass adoption of course it needs to um operate and and be able to hold all these people using it um simultaneously since um every second of of the day around the world so um it, it really does make sense for for that that movement and um you know congratulations to you guys i'm looking forward to seeing that all being implemented and drive forwards um ironically this kind of actually leads me to partially a bit of a selfish topic because i do actually invest personally in like um hydrogen uh, hydrogen stocks i think this is the future of energy um and i came across some really cool articles i, I know you guys have been heavily involved in certification It'd be great to know a bit more about that side of things but you, your points re re really resonate with me in, in what we just spoke about a moment ago in terms of you know the tracking the trading ability and perhaps hydrogen is a great example of that because it's it's up it has been around for a while it's still in development but it's upcoming and it will for sure be used around the world um massively perhaps uh get a bit of your your take on the hydrogen market where power ledger sits with that and also that certification element that you guys got involved with as well yeah uh so i think we're starting to see some of the you know corporate players that have you know previously made commitments to be say carbon neutral or net zero or 100% renewable thinking about, well, really, how do we, um, you know, not just sort of do that with offsets on an annualized basis, but actually start to buy, uh, you know, renewable energy matched against the load consumption of of the, you know, the, the assets mm -hmm. that are using the electricity. And so this movement, which is called 24-7 carbon-free energy, started to emerge, which can mean that you're buying energy 
um, at the time and the place in you know where um, it's also consumed. Um, so instead of say, for example, you're you know consuming electricity in January, you might buy a renewable energy certificate that was con- consumed uh, created in April, and mm-hmm. uh, you know that's actually a legal and valid way to do an offset. But increasingly, as more and more companies have been sort of doing that, you're creating kind of oversupply of renewable energy in April, but there's not necessarily commensurate consumption. So this kind of, and what that actually means in terms of the grid is it's caused oversupply in the grid in parts of, you know, in cities and parts of the world and not enough energy when and where it's needed. And so as this kind of realization has um, kind of emerged, the 24 seven carbon free um, energy movement uh, kind of sprung out. And uh, I'd say I mentioned that because it's very similar to what we're seeing with carbon, with green, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, with um, green hydrogen. And the UK is actually leading the way uh, with that in terms of wanting to see hourly matching and actually, um, I think, half hour matching. So if the hydrogen is going to be called green, they want it to be with energy that was actually generated uh, from renewable sources at the time and the place that the hydrogen was manufactured. And the to do that, that requires you to track all of the energy. Because if you think about like a hydrogen plant, it might actually have many different sources of energy coming in and you need to track every type, time and place to be able to do that. Um, and uh, in terms of Power Ledger, we're a founding member of the Zero Carbon um, Certification Scheme from the Smart Energy Council in Australia. And so we've been engaged in um, the development of the standards that are being going to be used by industry as green hydrogen plants come online. So there many of them are kind of being contemplated right now and under construction, but there's not a lot of actually... Um, uh, capacity yet, but in the next few years, you'll start to see, um, you know, a lot of plants coming online. So now is the time where the kind of tracking for that is um, uh, being, like the systems for tracking that are being developed. And I'd say also um, Europe's thinking about that quite deeply. They had quite a lot of um, initial rules um, touted and they weren't seen as being particularly helpful. They were actually overly onerous, and so a lot of money was leaving Europe and going to the US um, as mm-hmm. a, a result of the um, piece of regulation called the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the IRA, which had very um, attractive kind of incentives for government, uh, so for industry to develop um, green hydrogen projects. Um, so Europe kind of came up with a kind of response to that, which still looks at tracking of um, the inputs for energy, but is far more practical and easier for industry to implement. So I'd say that the 24-7 carbon-free energy movement and the green hydrogen movement are quite similar to each other in terms of how the services that they're going to need to actually validate the kind of sources of energy and the claims that are being made about the provenance of energy um, that's used inside them. That's great. I think it just it just showcases like the forward thinking. Um, and it's great to see that you guys are, you know, thinking in that capacity and and definitely developing right now to to get ready for all of this pretty much um is, is really interesting and, and thanks for covering that um it helps me out with my mind as well on, on the hydrogen side of things so i'm sure the audience uh, absolutely loved that too um Gemma, it's it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the channel uh, i know we've run out of time um but absolutely would love to have you back on again in the near future um, everyone's obviously going to keep a firm eye, I believe, on on Power Ledger's developments, certainly in the next few months and and the coming year, as we see these uh, these new exciting uh, bits of news dripping out. Um, so thanks again, Gemma. Um, absolutely fantastic to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, guys, hope you found that informative. I certainly did, and it's absolutely fantastic to have Gemma back on the show. Uh, hopefully we'll get her back on in the near future but that's absolutely really interesting to see the developments of power ledger and the pwr token moving forward of course there was the previous escrow model which is now being phased out to the transaction fee model which is very much resonating with how solana is operating and of course the sparks token previously will be phased out if not phased out already also so there's some really defining moments here for power ledger as a technology and also as a project moving forward as the energy sector continues 
to create waves, the utilization of blockchain technology in particular, the ability for consumers and prosumers to really take advantage of these new systems as they progress. So really exciting times coming forward. Of course, we mentioned in a previous video that interaction here, certainly in the UK, where we've got the definition and laws provided now for cryptocurrency and digital currency usage. We've got trade finance. We know there's an energy bill going through right now, albeit doesn't, as I mentioned in the interview, specify exactly DLT, but we do know there's parliamentary documentation around the energy sector utilizing the likes of AI, IoT, and blockchain. So this is a very fascinating time to see the developments of blockchain and cryptography moving forwards. And the fact that Power Ledger is one of those massively advanced technologies and technology partners that are looking to push this space further and ultimately change the energy sector forever. So guys, as I said, Thank you, Gemma, for coming back onto the channel. And I look forward to the next update video of Power Ledger and all things energy sector within blockchain. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.